Thanks for this opportunity to uh, present uh, this session in honor of uh, Vencat. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, stuff that's very much directly uh, uh, associated with Vencat and actually drawing from one of his papers. Um, so of course, AI machine learning now is a very, very uh, hot field. Um, current state deep learning data science has really um, massive, massively sort of uh, taken over the world motivated by advances in uh, computer vision, speech, recognition, national language uh, processing. <clears throat> and there's all these different things, IBM Go, Alexa, et cetera. Um, and many of you may have seen this where uh, a human uh, lost to Google uh, DeepMind uh, playing a game of Go. And there's this famous uh, case where Watson uh, beat, uh, beat a few uh, humans. Commercial impact, tw trillions of dollars. A lot of industries on board, so at least 50% has that, or roughly 50% AI is absolutely critical for success in manufacturing. <clears throat> so now I want to talk a bit about AI and uh, chemical engineering. The best definition I have uh, that I've seen, I think it was actually uh, quoted in a VenCap paper, AI is the study of how to make computers do something better than a human can or a person can. And there are basically four phases that were articulated in uh, Venkat's AISHE perspective. A phase zero, which is early work by Powers, Red, Sorolla, and others, where they were already doing a lot of these kind of ideas, in this case, adaptive initial design. And if you look at what's in the quotes, which is right from the um, work of one of their papers, you're like, wow, that sounds exactly like us, exactly like AI. And that was back in the 60s and 70s. Then there was the expert systems phase that happened. That was around the 1980s. A lot of software was produced uh, by you know, Art and George uh, and others. Uh, this just shows one of the examples. And you look at what was going on, you're like, wow, this is really sounds like AI today. And that was actually done quite, quite a long time ago. Um, <clears throat> so Venkat points out a lot of issues in his perspectives. Um, it took a lot of time, uh, effort, and money to build a well-performing system. And very often, if you try to drive it just from data, which would be really difficult, there just wasn't enough data. And there were issues about maintenance. Um, then there was the neural nets phase. Um, and neural nets have been standard industrial practice in the process industry since the 90s, I mean, including Pavilion and others. And so it's always amazing when people don't refer to that stuff that's uh, stuff that you can just buy off the shelf. Um, it's useful when data are plentiful, and so that's true, so it has limited their application, but more and more data is becoming available, so they're becoming more and more tractable. So what limited the phases back in 1, 2 uh, was really, uh, they didn't have the powerful and cheap computing, storage, communications, and environments that they have today. Data were limited, resources, very expensive. Now, lots and lots of free software, easy to use, very powerful, and huge uh, increases in quantity fast and cheap computers, and especially fast and cheap memory. I mean, it's very critical for these applications. So that's sort of a very brief uh, history of, uh, of AI, basically a condensation of what Van Kapp was in AICG's perspectives. And I want to talk a little bit about um, moving forward and what we've been looking at. So as we mentioned before, you know, Industry 4.0 was pushed by Europe uh, to do this idea of smart factory. Um, a lot of the people in Chemie are sort of in this space, so looking more at production and traceability and condition monitoring. We've heard about that. Um, in the pharma, biopharma, they call it Pharma 4.0 or Biopharma 4.0. There's an example we did some years ago, it's almost a decade, where we did full digitalization of a factory, um, where everything was completely digital and did it all in the computer first, designed the entire thing, including all the controls, implemented it first time it worked. You know, So, so this kind of stuff is now to the point where uh, you can do these things readily, but it's a natural extension of what chemical engineers have been doing uh, for decades. So what's new is what we've been doing and, and others is really trying to get automated workflows. And so it's how do you automate what the people do to develop the process? So something like this was developed by six faculty and a bunch, you know, an army of postdocs and graduate students. How do you try to automate that? How do you replace a human and hopefully do better than a human can? And so we've been looking at basically five different strategies, right, to find things in terms of five strategies. And I mentioned quite a few people are working on this, including Klaus Jensen and others. And so this includes process intensification uh, strategies, uh, microscale technologies, plug and play modules, dynamic models, uh, modeling, plant-wide simulation, sort of the bread and butter of, of controls people. But also this last little bit about smart data analytics, which is much more of a natural extension of, 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 of more towards Venkat's work as opposed to 
a lot of the other stuff that I list here is, is more of extension of George Stephanopoulos and the work of others. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the last part because that's sort of where a lot of the buzzwords are. So there's been a, and one of the big limitations of data analytics uh, today um, compared to in the past, um, there are so many tools now from so many areas that it's very hard just to pick the best methods for a particular problem. And they're really coming from everywhere nowadays. It's quite a bit different than it was 50 years ago. And so users basically apply the tool they know. So if they're PLS, they apply PLS, for example. If they're neural nets, they apply neural nets. Um, and those are very powerful methods, but sometimes they're not the right, for the right, right tool for the application. And so that motivates a systematic approach to really have the user focus on goals rather than methods. And in the machine learning community, they call that AutoML. But we've shown, and, and others have shown, um, some computer scientists, those ones are very poor when applied to uh, process data. And so one of the things we've been doing is actually interrogating the data set to ascertain its characteristics systematically and then picking the best methods. And so that's basically what we've done. We've been applying this to a lot of different pharma and biopharma applications primarily, but also lithium ion batteries and other things. And so it's basically, if you look at it, it's an expert system. It's basically going through, analyzing the data, has a bunch of if-then statements, it's just an expert system. So, and then what we have is you can write it sort of this triangle to simplify a decision tree describing an expert system. Um, and so you can kind of simplify it in sort of a nice little uh, convenient graphical way where if you have data as primary nonlinearity, then those are the best in class methods. If it's dynamics, it's those are the best class. We have a lot of theory and algorithmic and case studies to justify this selection. It's not something that should be a flying amber. People will keep making improvements and making it better, but we feel that this is a good way to hopefully move the field forward so that instead of publishing a paper where you're better than 1%, you know, in one very specific case study, run through a lot of these case studies and really go through and, and have this as a foundation. This is all public, anyone can use it. We have no ownership of it. Um, and hopefully that will uh, try to move that field forward on this key issue about how to select the right tool uh, for a particular type of problem. <clears throat> oh, by the way, the things on the edges mean like nonlinearity and dynamics, that's this method, culinary. So you can basically look at the parts of the triangle and figure out uh, which tools. And we also have things where you take into account metadata and ask questions like interpretable versus non-interpretable. A lot of the ideas that were discussed back in the 70s and 80s in chemical engineering, we basically just put it in our expert system. So we actually were motivated at this by a biogen application. This was a real data from a couple different manufacturing sites. Um, and we applied this method, and we've shown that we were able to outperform, this is a couple years ago, um, all the methods that were used in Biogen, which is a very good group. I mean, their status, statistics group is a very good group, but we were able to beat it on this very difficult uh, data set. And it turned out it was a machine learning type uh, algorithm for uh, small quantities of bad data as opposed to big data, um, which is actually a lot easier, um, somewhat ironically. I wanted to make one other quick comment. Um, even though there's all this stuff with machine learning and data analytics, Really, you know, there's also been a huge amount of understanding, including biopharma. And so now you can actually write all these models you couldn't even dream of, let's say, 30 years ago. But you can because of all the advances in molecular biology and sensor analytics uh, called PAT in the field. And so, of course, you want to move up as high as you can here in terms of first principles and mechanistic modeling. And uh, hybrid modeling is another approach that was studied decades ago. And, but it's actually still not solved in the sense that things are very specific to the domain. And so there is no systematic approach for doing that. And so a lot of people are working on this, is how do you combine data analytics, machine learning, these kind of ideas with first principles models? And there are Emmys, Chemies, computer scientists, operations results. This is like a huge field now, trying to figure out better ways of, of doing this from various different kinds of angles. And so I, I think there'll be a lot more research, at least for the next uh, 10 or 20 years uh, moving forward. So, so to summarize, AI machine learning uh, is changing chemical engineering. It is reducing cost, um, that, uh, or the reducing cost suggests a larger impact that's going to keep going and that this has legs and, and won't be just a temporary blip. Digitalization has the potential to automate workflows. Our own group has over six applications where we've done things digitally and then built it and had them work, you know, either first time or second time, which is not something you could really have done now, but I mean in the past, but now something you actually do. Um, and this includes gene therapy, and includes you know, vaccines, a wide variety of different things that you really couldn't think you could do, but, but now you actually can. Smart manufacturing have already been demonstrated in automated integrated manufacturing. 
Um, intelligence built on top of process data analytics has potential to increase productivity, and there are many examples of that. And I gave an example of using data interrogation to automatically select tools within the point of expert system. If you actually looked into the thing, I also had neural nets in there too. So neural nets are still so from the past as part of, part of the solution for the right kinds of uh, data problems. Um, here's some references. This is one of our, our most recent perspectives about smart data analytics, or sorry, smart manufacturing we did in the context of biopharma. And then we have a series of papers. Um, these are the main ones on uh, smart data analytics that I talked about. And pretty much, I think all these, almost all these are computers and chemi, so we all know, we all know where to go for those. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, funding from the US uh, FDA. Uh, thank you for your time. <clears throat>